So uh, I'm uh, nice to meet you, everybody. And uh, I am Jean-Paul Chapu, and I am the, the lead architect of the Coriolis toolchain, uh, which is the RTL to JDS2 toolchain. So I will present uh, the outline of that toolchain in this presentation. So uh, I will start to present what is uh, a layout, uh, how to make an ASIC, and then uh, finish by a little demo. So um, the first thing, uh, just a, a bit political to, to start, is what, why are we doing uh, Coriolis? So in the, in the last years, there, there was a big trend about uh, open hardware. But open hardware stops at uh, the RTL level, that is the logical description of your component or your ASIC. What we want to achieve with open EDA is allow you to go down to the silicon. Uh, that is really make the chip uh, all the way down. So that's, that's our main goal. Obviously, it has also some interest for the academics. Uh, in the sense that uh, the, the way ASICs are done today, they cannot share, uh, academics cannot neither share their design nor uh, tweak the tools. You have to use the commercial tools and you have to use them as they, uh, as they are and you cannot change them. So in that regard, uh, Coriolis is a big uh, progress in the sense that if the, algori the algorithm didn't fit your needs, or you want to make some very special tweak, you can do it. Of course, it also gives you the ability to publish, share, and modify the hardware design, like the, it's the ID very close to the GPL and the, the free software. This is, this is why it's a false uh, tool chain. And uh, beyond that, what we want to achieve is to build a community. So people can share their design. You can not only tweak the tool, but you can also share your design and start to build the community and not reinvent the wheel in each company. Uh, we also want to um, to open the market to SMEs because uh, today only very big companies can afford the, the price of the tools uh, to make ASICs. Uh, Another point is the security issues. Something people are uh, not often very much aware is that you cannot have software security unless you have hardware, uh, secure hardware. It is uh, easy to introduce uh, hardware Trojan inside the, uh, the design and at hardware level. And it will be absolutely impossible to suppress. And it's a danger. When you have fabless companies, they want to ensure that the design they send to the foundry or to the, the, the factory that make chips, that what they get back is exactly why they send, and not some slightly modified design. And one last point is that in some occasion you need the hardware for a very long period of time. You can take uh, the, the first example that comes to mind, especially when you are in France, is the nuclear power plants. Nuclear power plants have been qualified for a certain type of hardware, and ASICs, and to, to stay qualified as operational, you need to have this hardware uh, along the, the, uh, during the, the, the lifetime, the whole lifetime of your plant. That means 50 to 60 years. And uh, having one chip available for 60 years, uh, I don't know even of one of them uh, now. So that's potentially a problem. So that's what we want to do. About now an ASIC, I am uh, I am assuming that you that some of the, some of you are uh, are not familiar with what is uh, making an ASIC. So. The first point of making an ASIC is basically an ASIC. What is it? Uh, you send it to the to the what you send to the factory is a layout, a big drawing. A layout is basically a big drawing, and but of course a very complex one. This the, the one I display here is a very very old one, back from the 80s, 
Uh, the point is that it's not too small so that you can see, still see uh, the parts. But uh, nowadays, they are so, so, so small, the, the rectangle, the, the, the drawing are so small that you barely can see anything. But anyway, the point is that it's just a drawing, but a drawing that obeys a vast amount of rules. This is not any drawing, and it is basically a map. So, back to the, the design flow, and what I want to illustrate here is to, uh, for people who are most familiar with the FPGA design flow, because FPGA is mo much more affordable, and uh, many people are working on FPGA, especially uh, in open hardware. On the left side, you have the classical design flow for FPGA, uh, I, I, I take it uh, uh, an open design flow, a first design flow, with you have as, as a first step the logical synthesis, usually performed by IOSIS. Then you perform a place and route on the FPGA matrix with a, a tool like NextPNR or VTR. That tool in the end generates a bit stream that you send to the FPGA and it is used to configure the material component of the FPGA that is the, the communication matrix, and the LUTs. But a, an FPGA is a kind of specialized ASIC. On the right side, you have the, uh, the first step is almost the same, that is, it's a logical synthesis, but on a different target. It's not targeting the FPGA, it's targeting the standard cell library. You get the netlist, and then you perform the physical synthesis. The physical synthesis is the task of making the mask. At, the, at this stage here, you have the layout, the famous layout, and then you send your layout to the foundry. And the, the foundry is the factory which is tasked to, uh, to build your chip. Typically, this is TSMC. Uh, I won't... Uh, uh, I am sure you are aware of the weight and the importance of TSMC in Taiwan. So, in the right tool chain, we have uh, currently two roadblocks. The first one is the foundry. Uh, because the foundry uh, imposes NDA, non-disclosure agreement, to protect its technology. Because that layout is very informative about how you do things and how your technology works. So, in order to protect their uh, secrets, most of the foundry uh, impose NDA. That is, you cannot share your design. You can, you can only transmit your design, your layout, to the foundry tasked to build it. The second roadblock is at the level of the EDA tool. The EDA tools um, are very costly. Because the design are usually costly, if you make a chip, it's costly, then you can afford, usually, you can afford costly EDA tools. For example, I think uh, for uh, one of the main uh, provider, which is the main company, which is Cadence, uh, one, uh, one license is 100,000 euros per year. So, uh, it's, uh, it's okay for big companies like Apple, IBM, and others. But for SMEs, uh, it's completely out of the question. And for uh, individual, uh, even, even more so. So, what we are tackling here is that. We are tackling the EDA tool problem. We will see also that the NDA problem has started to be broken by Google, which is providing for free uh, uh, a technology which is the Skywater 180 nanometer. And global foundries have started to do the same with a 180 nanometer technology. So this roadblock is uh, starting to crumble, and we, we had to do the same here. Because to lower the price here, if the, if the price lowers here, we need to lower the price here too, and also give freedom. So now let's, let's have a, a small detour about the standard cell library. So it's a kind of a zoom on a part of the flow. So you still see the logical synthesis part, uh, the, the, the point of the logical synthesis is to break your design. Here it's the, the RTL version of your design, which means uh, the logical description of your design. It's uh, basically a big set of Boolean uh, equations. 
So you break your Boolean equations into small bits, which are the standard cell. Basically, it's small bits of logic. You have non gates, nor gate, and flip flops. I mean, okay, you have uh, much more than uh, than that in terms of gate, but basically, it's an atomic Boolean function and memories, small memories, one bit memories. So you break that into the standard cell library. The point of the standard cell library is that it has an equivalent in terms of layout. So each bit that you have on the left side can be replaced by a, a, a bit on the right side, which is its equivalent in silicon, the, the, the drawing in silicon, that can perform that function. And then you reassemble them to build your wall layout. And this is the task of the two steps here, place, then route. We will uh, go into those two steps deeper in the following uh, slides. So, but the point is that the pivotal point is the standard cell library. So we need standard cell library to, uh, to, to make our designs. And moreover, it's the layout which is interesting us. That is the drawing, the atomic drawing of it. So, let's dig a bit deeper in the layouts. You have on the right side the direct way to do it. That is, you have rules to make your uh, layout, your drawing, uh, rules which are expressed in uh, micrometer or nanometer, and then you draw your, your library. But the problem is that every time you change of technology, of target, te target technology, say you want to go from an AMS 180 nanometer node to a TSMC 180 nanometer node, then you have to redraw all your standard cells. So a standard cell library can contain uh, between 100 gates and maybe uh, uh, 1,000 gates in, in the case of uh, latest, the latest one. So that's uh, quite a lot of work. And in the 80s, uh, two American professors make an observation. It was Mead and Conway in the 80s. They are quite famous for that. They, they made the observation that the technology are not so different. Meaning, if you have uh, a technology in um, maybe one micron, and you go down to um, 50, 100, uh, no, 500 uh, nanometers, then finally, what you do is mostly perform a shrinking. All the technologies are almost the same, but they are just uh, bit, the, the, the difference between them is just a scaling factor. So what they said, instead of drawing or uh, layout in directly in the target uh, the target dimension, we use uh, an anonymous dimension. This is the lambda. It's called the lambda. You draw all your lambda, and then you perform just a translation, saying that, okay, my target is 180 nanometers, then one lambda equals 180 nanometers. Of course, it's a bit complex, it's a bit more complex to compute the value of the lambda, but basically, this is what we do. And we can translate uh, our library almost autom automatically to any target. So this is... Uh, so we have another approach, which was developed by PDK Master from Staff Veragen. We'll talk about it a bit later, which is you stick diagrams instead of a true rectangle, and then you use another program which flesh out the stick diagrams and give the, the sticks the right size. So that's, that's another approach. So basically, what we can do with symbolic layout is that you have your symbolic layout, and then through a simple tool, which is called S2R, symbolic to real, you can uh, project your design to uh, any technology. You, you can have AMS, TSMC, those two are under NDA, but you can so also use the one which are not NDA now, which are Global Foundries, 180, or Skywater, 130 nanometers. So this is the point of symbolic layout. Another uh, advantage that was not foreseen at the time, is that those layout, um, this one, for, sorry, the symbolic layout is free of NDA, at, as it is not related to any specific technological node, it is not in their NDA, and you can share that design, so people, for people to see what you have done. 
and you can people can even use that layout to compare with the real one because the differences are not so big and if you want to see some some transistor or uh, trojan sort uh, uh, hardware trojan had been added you can see it by comparing the two layouts because they are not so different unfortunately uh, this approach this symbolic approach uh, is no longer working for deeper node because of a difference of the shrinking rate between the active area meaning the transistors and the wiring that is the metal wire that connect uh, the standard cell between them so we have developed some hybrid approach that is what Coriolis can manage is those four approaches it can, it can manage a wide range of mix between symbolic layout and completely real layout so on the left side we have the most symbolic one each uh, uh, each arrow here mean a symbolic to real translation so here we have a symbolic to real translation here we have one and here we have one so we have the first approach which is the the true symbolic which means you translate your whole design your standard cells and your wires everything in one go is translated this approach is no longer working well at least for a deeper node but what we, we we started to implement is that we only translate the standard cell library and then we draw the wire with real wires we do the same with pdk master but the difference is that the, the process the s 2 process is different between the two the the, the process are different to get better results i mean we we don't know yet which one is giving the better result in terms of fitting the technology and lastly coriolis can also manage fully real layout so end-to-end -end real you use real cells and you, you generate a real design so it's a feature which is uh, not often uh, it's often overlooked but it's very important and it, ga it gives coriolis a lot of flexibility about uh, what he what he does so let's get back to the uh, world design flow so it's i say world design flow but it's still uh, a simplified version for example here the little box validation is a lot of tools in fact it's a complex things but the idea is to give you an, uh, an, uh, an outline so you have the cell library here which is used by the, the logical synthesis and the physical synthesis uh, when i said that coriolis is a world design flow it is a bit of a lie in the sense that we only provide the blue part to the standard cell library in some, in some case and mostly the physical synthesis step because this is a huge work to provide all the bits and what we provide is integration uh, Coriolis provide a way to integrate all those steps through a Python script based on do it so to simplify and to be more uh, the marketing uh, message we just say it's Coriolis it's, it's simpler for people but we are using other tool like GHDL, which is a VHDL simulator uh, to, to, to check your design and simulate your design. We can take any design coming from those HDL generator. So NMIGEN is now Amarant, mostly. You have actually Chisel, Spinal HDL, which is a variant of Chisel. Yeah. And then you get your RTL. Then you get your logical synthesis. After the logical synthesis, you check that your design is still good by comparing the results of the simulation of the two here the, the, the you have also a ghdl validation but not only you have a step like DRC, drc on lvx when you check that your layout itself is correct and you check that the netlist that you got is the same as the one you want and finally you get the symbolic to real translation and then you can under nda perform some validation with Kali out is the DRC and other DRC um, okay this is the variant of the of the design flow when you are using uh, the real um, the, the real layout directly in that case the s 2 step disappear and you go straight straight to the real layout and then the validation through Kali out and of course you cannot distribute the cell the cell library the cell library is under NDA this is no, no longer true for the liberated technology like the Skywater and the Global Foundries 180. So, 
what does placement uh, mean? As I said, when you perform, when you have uh, after, we, we are after the logical synthesis step. So we have rip, we have broken down your, uh, you have broken down your design into gates, and you can replace those gates by their equivalent in terms of layout, which are represented here. And usually, you have to place them inside a square area. But you don't place them like uh, just at random or with completely arbitrary rules. In fact, you put them in, in rows, and the rows are stacked on top of each other. Moreover, the rows are, uh, which are, have, have different orientation, because here you see that you have uh, usually power lines on top and on the bottom of the standard cell. So VSS, the ground, on the bottom, and the power line, VDD, on the top. To share, in order to share the power lines between rows, you have to, uh, to flip them over one row over two. And so you see that we have, uh, so in, uh, in the Y coordinate, in the vertical coordinate, you have to respect a certain uh, slice, so they are pitched, and it's the same horizontally, but it's a smaller, it's a smaller pitch. So you get a more leeway in the horizontal direction than in the vertical direction. This is the work of the placer. The placer is tasked to that with um, some other uh, um, accessory goal, which are minimizing the wire lengths, the, the first one. Then, on top of the data placement, you do not forget that you have the metal wires. Metal wires are used to connect all those cells. The stack of metal wire is uh, usually organized like that. It's not up to scale, of course. So you have metals, metal one, metal two, metal three, metal four. Between those metals, you can perform some holes, which are called vias. A via is typically defined between two metals, and there is a small quirk, which is that on the last, uh, on the, the deepest level, it's called the contact, because it goes to the substrate. The substrate is where the transistor lives. So you have contact on the first level, and then vias just a question of terminology. Those layers are organized in a certain way. In fact, they are, they are alternatively put horizontally and vertically. This way, they define a grid, a gigantic grid, where you put your wire. You don't have, for example, uh, 45 degree wires. You can have them, but not in digital design. Basically, they are all vertical or on the horizontal making grid. And at the, at the crossing, you can put, uh, optionally, a contact, uh, no, uh, sorry, a via. So, this is what it gives you. Uh, when you have placed your design, then you have to connect your uh, standard cells, and you, you, you do so using that grid. This, here, the grid has only two layers, the metal two, which is horizontal, and the metal three, which is vertical, but you can have more stack of layer, but for the sake of the presentation, I only represented two. So that's the problem of the routine, and that's too big a problem. In fact, uh, there is too much information. Uh, you cannot put that into memory uh, of a computer, of an actual computer, so you have to shrink down the problem. This is where the G cell comes into play. G cells are just group that is, you, you cut down, you, you make a, a degraded version of your problems by putting 10 by 10 blocks in, uh, together. In fact, instead of having all the tracks, I just said I have one, uh, one, one node with an edge of 10. This is what is represented here. This is the node, and here we have a 10 capacity. That meaning that I can put 10 wires on that side and 10 wires on that side. And I will solve the routing problem, finding the path between the gates on that global routing, on that global routing grid. And you can see that as we have 10 by 10, the size of the grid is shrunk by a, by a ratio of, of 100. So I reduce the, the size of the problem by the 100 factor, which is considerable, and then I can manage it. The computer can manage it. So we start by routing on that big grid, and then we finish the work with the detailed routine. So that explains you the three steps of making, a, at least three steps of making a chip, which are placement, 
global routing, and finally, detailed routing. We will see that in the small demo at the end. So we have other problems to solve, which are, uh, for example, the high fan out net synthesis. In a logical equation, what you say is that uh, I have uh, this uh, lo logical gate, this Boolean equation, which is either 1 or 0, and then I drive any number of things. That is, that, that, uh, that, uh, that value can appear in any other equation anywhere in the chip. But when you make an ASIC, this is not true. Because that wire <coughs> is basically uh, the RC. So you have a load at the end, the capacitance, and the wire is a resistor. So you have delays and you have a drive capacitance, and you cannot drive too many of them. So what you have to do is to break your big wire, uni your unique wire, into a tree of wire. So at any, any stage, you do not overload the output capacity of the driver, and you keep a sufficiently fast design. Sure, sure, Even sure. more complex sure. for the clock tree. Sean, sure, can, can we... The clock tree is... You. Can, can, we have, yes. can, can we place it in 10 minutes? I mean, I, don't, I know this is a little bit impolite, but... Uh, okay. So, sorry. <laughs> so I will, uh, I will just keep the, the, the ship Yarshti. So the, um, the dependency problem, the, the problem is that when you build algorithm, uh, the algorithm are interdependent. You need to uh, the better the, the, be the best implementation is to make them interdependent. Um, one other key point of Coriolis is that it's everything in Python. We write uh, you, you control Coriolis through complex Python script, and you can intertwine C plus plus on Python. The high efficiency part are written in C plus plus, and the low part, the, the slow part, are written in Python. Python. We made some chips, for example, the LibreOSOC chip, which is made in TSMC 100 on 80 nanometer. So it's uh, 1.3 million transistors, uh, of which uh, with, uh, with 800 and uh, some, you can read the, the text. I am not a bit in a hurry. Sorry. Oh, boo, boo. So uh, the mean, LibreOSOC chip. That's a very chip. good project. <laughs> uh, it's, uh, we are quite proud. And it's, uh, it's partially working in the sense that the, 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 the tiny thing you can see here is the PLL, and the PLL works, but we weren't able to, to test the whole chip uh, for a quite stupid problem. That is, the, the, the design team of the chip wasn't able to provide us test pattern, in fact. So uh, it seems to work, but we don't have test pattern, and we, can, we cannot test it uh, extensively. But the PLL works, and the PLL means that the IO, the IO pad works, and the standard cell works. We have also made a small uh, VEX RIS-5, uh, this one through uh, the Google program. Uh, we don't know if it works yet because we don't have the chip back yet. And finally, we, also, we are also working with a company which is called Pragmatic Sony, which made flexible ICs, and we have made that for them. This chip has been tested functional. In, I mean, it was uh, with a yield of 70%. So it's a small one, but it's on a flexible substrate. The idea is to, for example, for wearable, and it works. So I will uh, go very quickly, uh, because I want to, to make the demonstration. So I will uh, share my transparent later, so you can read it by yourself. But I think the, the whole interesting point is the demonstration. I hope you see well my terminal. First, I will clean the directory. Yeah, we can see your screen. OK. So now I, will, I, I did remove the previous run, the result of the previous run. The point, as I said, Coriolis is extensively using Python. So what I use now is a replacement for makefile, which is do it. And you can see the rule in dodo.py. So what you have to write, to, to describe what you want to do with your design, the rule you want to apply is just write a simple Python file. This is the, 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 this is the complete Python file. You see, it's not, uh, you said what you want, and uh, for example, I have the PNR rule here, and you, you can see it. Uh, okay. We have also a second file, which is the do design.py which describe what you want to do with your design, how to, to make your design, effectively. 
So the longest part of this uh, design is indi indicating where the IO are. So you have a few, uh, some <coughs> sorry, configuration parameter, and that's it. It's mostly copy paste. Once you have one new design, you can create a new one very quickly. So first thing first, we will do B2V, which means performing the logical synthesis. B2V is B2VST. In fact, we apply Yosis. For those familiar with Yosis in the FPGA, you can recognize its output. And then you get your netlist. Here I have my netlist, which is in VST. VST is uh, in house. It's a um, degraded version of uh, VHDL netlist. VST for VHD, uh, VST for VHDL structural, which means in fact VHDL netlist. Then I will start in graphical mode and run the script. Oh. Ah. Sorry, it will go fast if I don't activate the breakpoint. So I will first check that I have the breakpoint activated. Okay, breakpoints are activated. So we can start. Here. So shift time. Of course, you can do that uh, by programmation. So the first step is to clear to create the clock tree. What you see here is the clock tree. It's a very simple one. There is only one level because it's a small design. And the point is not to making you wait too long. Then we done the iPhone outnet synthesis. And you can see because it's done at uh, netlist level. But now we will perform the placement. Ah, very good. In, in fact, it's slower because uh, of the transmission. So it's an uh, analytic placer which slowly spread the netlist. That is, it's like um, uh, no, you, you know, uh, a problem with um, uh, springs. You have load, uh, weight, and spring, and you try to minimize the the, the, the energy of the whole system. It's a very, uh, it's a, the, the base is a classical algorithm, but uh, the implementation is quite uh, quite uh, is very very good, very well done. So you see here the the, the structural row, the row of the placement can see them. So now we perform the global routing. We are before the global routing. So in order to highlight best the process, I will select one net. So you can see exactly what happens. The, the violet line are the fly line. So I will select one net. The point is, I don't want too big a net. For example, A0. Where is A0? It's uh, too big. A1. A2. OK, this one is suitable. So, A11. No. I said A1 to net, then I keep it selected so we can see the whole process, A1, and I hide it. So now you see the fly line of one net, that is the global router, then the detailed router have to connect those three points. So now we are going to perform the global routing. Here you see the global routing. That is, you have a wire, but which is not very detailed. It goes to the center of the G cells, but you see that it's it's a progress from the start. And then we will perform the detailed routing. So now I have constructed the first iteration of the detailed routing, and now I will finish it. I will perform the true routing process which means solving the overlaps, because all those wires will overlap at first. And then you have the list, the, the, those little counters which show the decreasing. OK, that's finished. You have performed the routing, and it says that it's OK. 
So you can see here, more detailed way, you have your detailed routine. Okay. And it's pretty shady. Uh, something I can I didn't have time to, to show you is that it also Coriolis is also able to manage analog design. I mean and not only analog design but mixed design. That is design containing analog part and uh, digital part. It's uh, uh, it's at actually so de at, at a demonstrator stage. Uh, it's not fully. Uh, it's, it's almost working. And okay, I think okay. I will stop there. Thank you. Thank you so much. It's really, really, really fascinating to see this. And uh, I think we don't have time for QA because we have uh, Shimizu Sound here too. Maybe you, you do want to stay with us, or you just, uh, or you, maybe you can send send us the slides and we can ask you a question offline. I can send you a slide, yes. Okay. Uh, I, I will stay online, uh, at least for the presentation of uh, Naoshiko, Naoshi, Professor Shimizu san. Okay. 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 Uh, but I will also send you the, the slides. Okay. And you can ask me questions if you like. Uh, okay, thank you. By email. Okay, okay. Okay. So. Shimizu san, do you have the. Okay. Oh, okay, 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 okay. You have your own one. Please, 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 your... 